Welcome to Paleontology. For this introduction, I'm going to talk about what a fossil is, what organisms typically can be found as fossils, and then the way they tend to be preserved. But before I do that, look at this slide right here. This kind of gives you an idea of the amount of information you have to know about paleontology. Now, obviously, I'm on the extreme right of here, the bench, so called bench paleontologists. It's my profession. And all of you are in that next category there. <clears throat> you are some flavor of geology, biology, uh, anthro, environmental science majors. And paleontology, whether you know it or not, rears its head quite a bit in all of those disciplines. A little bit farther back, uh, our whole wonderful group of K-12 science teachers. And then even beyond that, we have various citizen scientists, volunteers, people that help with digs, help cleaning up things, help prepping. And then finally, way back there, I always say, this is where my parents are, society. Uh, just knowing what fossils are, the value of them in a general sense, and that's probably good enough. Um, just as an aside here, I've also posted a short little two-page read from Prothero 2004. That was the textbook that I used to use in this class, but he still has a pretty good section right at the beginning on the four major reasons why students that are taking this class should study fossils. So have a look at that. If we look at what the word fossil means, it has a Greek root and it originally means just something dug up out of the ground. And so in the old days you had people that if they found it in the ground somehow, and a lot of those things were fossils, but they could be anything else imaginable, pieces of garbage, debris, rocks, minerals, roots, leaves, anything like that, that would be a fossil. Well, today we've changed it. Today it needs to be the, any evidence that a once living organism is somehow preserved in the rocks that you're looking at. Now it can be animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, anything, as long as it was once living. And in general, to get that, you need the four or uh, the three following things. Hard parts, a skeleton, although that's not always true, but that's the first big step. Uh, you need to be buried rapidly. Uh, you need to be deposited within the sediment uh, and then covered continually by sediment like this. If not, you tend to quickly, quickly get decomposed, get destroyed by bacteria, fungi, other animals eating and, and distributing uh, the body parts, etc. Just think of your average deer, dead deer, or raccoon, or possum on the side of a highway. How long do they last there? Not terribly long. And then finally, it's not enough to be in the sediment. You need to be effectively sealed from other things that are going to destroy them. Bacteria operate a good way down into the sediment, and so you need to be down low enough and far enough where bacteria are not interacting with you. And then also there's a lot of groundwater and other fluids that are sort of coursing through the sediment, and those things have to or tend to have a destructive effect as well. And so if you jump through all three of those hoops, there's a good chance that you will become a fossil. This slide comes from a textbook of invertebrate zoology, and it's designed to show the students that were taking that class that the amount of invertebrates as numbers of species, families, genera, however you count it, is greatly, greatly um, dominated by invertebrates, things that aren't the vertebrates, the sexy stuff of the Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, National Geographic. Look at the small piece of the pie housed by vertebrates. And everything else here is an invertebrate. And also notice that over three quarters of it are insects, or arthropods, excuse me. So everything from insects which dominates that, but then also chelicerates, crustaceans, seafood, basically, um, as well. What else? Mollusks, clams, snails, other things, and then a bunch of other little wormy types, 
nematodes, flatworms, annelids, cnidarians are corals and anemones, and then all the other invertebrates here, and vertebrates, there it is. So it's an invertebrate dominated world, so therefore our fossil record will be an invertebrate dominated fossil record. If you then look at this picture, and this comes from an even older introductory uh, paleontology textbook that I used to use 20 years ago, this one takes that uh, same sort of pie chart looking at the um, uh, numbers and percentages of organisms on planet Earth, but they take each little slice of the pie and divide it between fossil species and living species. And here you see, ooh, insects, arthropods, those groups that dominated the invertebrate world and dominate invertebrate zoology classes don't form much of a fossil record. They really don't have much. If you really look at the very point of this pie, the other arthropods, you see a little bit filled in there. And that's because we do have fossil shrimp and lobsters and, and trilobites and things like that. But generally, no. And look at this record of insects. This is mostly because they are organisms that live on the land. And so when they die, just like that deer that I mentioned on the side of the road before, they tend to quickly get completely destroyed and recycled into the environment. So what forms the fossil record? Well, mollusks, you see that they have a good section of their pie is fossil mollusks, clams, snails, whatever. Uh, brachiopods and bryozoans you don't really know that well, and really most invertebrate zoology people don't know them very well. But you see they are greatly, greatly dominated by fossil species. Echinoderms, that's another group where most of the pie is fossil type. Uh, chordates, which includes the vertebrates. Notice there is a fossil record. We certainly know that. There's fossil mammals, fossil dinosaurs, fossil lizards, snakes, birds, all this kind of stuff. But we're going to talk about their record um, and their sad record, really, um, in just a little bit. So what else? Protozoa. Well, these aren't uh, these are single-celled creatures. They have a good fossil record, and then sponges, corals, good fossil record. Worms, not so much. So again, we have these different views of life on the planet. The way that invertebrate zoologists or just zoologists in general look at life on planet Earth, and then the way that paleontologists look at it as well. And so this is going to guide how we study and what we study in this class. I'm going to talk about this several times throughout the course, especially these first two weeks, and this is preservation pathways. How does a living organism, which then dies, go from being this dead organism of both hard and soft fleshy parts to a fully formed fossil? And so you see the different pathways here. At the very top, you've got a dead organism. The two little sort of arc-shaped things, that would be the shells on either a brachiopod or a clam, that kind of stuff. And then the pink stuff, well, that's the meat. So dead organism, potential body fossil. If there's immediate burial, there might be the chance that there's complete preservation of soft parts. That does happen sometimes. But notice it says it's extremely rare. Instead, there is what we call decay and transport. And the major uh, result of that is that all of the soft parts, notice all the pink is gone, and all we have left are the hard parts. Ultimately, we want these hard parts to get buried, and then we have many, many options here um, to sort of take us to do it. But notice at the very end, the little icons that are shown here, you have four little different objects that basically still show you the shape and general morphologic pattern of that original organism up here. But we lose data at every step along the way. Well, first look at this graph right here, death then decay. So we have decay of an organism. Something has died, and if there's minimum decay, sort of on, look at the y-axis first, well then you can preserve mineralized muscle or, in t or imprints of tissues, but as decay continues, 
you progressively lose the flesh, lose the tissue, lose chitin and cellulose, things like hair and nails, etc. You finally lose this lignified cellulose and ultimately you're left with what we call shelly fossils, basically hard parts. Mineralization. This is how quickly do these things turn from an organic matter object to a solid mineralized rock. And so if mineralization is early and decay is minimum, so in this sort of bottom left side of the um, graph here, you can get preserved tissues and muscles. Very, very rare. In fact, what happens is usually we have maximum decay and we have mineralization very late. And so the bulk of this field, this gray part, constitutes what most of our fossils are. We do have some of these sexy things here, but generally we are looking at this part of the field. So let's look at some types of preservation. If you actually have unaltered hard and soft parts, uh, they exist. So mammoths in Siberia, insects in amber, uh, these things are very data rich, uh, but they're extremely rare. Are they a future DNA source? Can we resurrect these things somehow by cloning them? I don't know, uh, certainly not now. That's it. And I'm going to try to find a link to show you um, uh, a couple of recent finds that have popped up out of the ground in Russia, usually, uh, that, are, that are like this. If we think then about the decay of soft parts, let's go back to Steno. For those of you that have had 204 with me, you know that I make a big deal about Steno, Nicholas Steno, uh, the fact that he was one of the first to recognize that the fossil shark teeth that he could find in the rocks in Italy were ultimately from an animal like this great white shark head that he dissected that was caught um, in the Mediterranean. And so he was one of the few, first few people to say that these things from the rocks came from once living creatures. And he also then recognized that if all I have are the teeth, then all of this other stuff, all the soft part of the, of the shark had to have been destroyed. It's lost. But even so, he was able to make and understand paleo paleobiological hypotheses with just these teeth. If we look at what we mostly have as far as fossils are concerned, we have hard parts, but we have them where they have been recrystallized. They've been altered. And so recrystallization, it's very common. And this is simply saying that the original skeleton of the organism, and you see here, an oyster, a clam, a crab, a, a nautilus, and then a snail. They might have made these hard parts out of a specific mineralogy, but once they're buried and in the rock record, they tend to change their mineralogy to something else, something that's more stable. So the classic example would be clams. They have a skeleton of the mineral aragonite, and it can be recrystallized to calcite. And as you can see here, this can be a really beautiful way of preserving fossils. You can have really wonderful detail of the hard parts. Here's another way that we can have hard parts, just wholesale replacement. You have the original skeleton, it's all there. What happens is the whole thing dissolves, but it leaves a perfect hole, the shape of that skeleton in the, in the sediment which then gets filled by another mineral. And so you have a solid chunk of mineral that replicates that organism. And both of these pictures here are doing this. So these organisms, these crinoids, we'll learn about them later, they make their skeletons out of calcite, but then they ha can be completely replaced by quartz, silica, pyrite, fool's gold, all kinds of things. So that's another way in which we'll um, commonly preserve fossils. Uh, another way, altered hard parts, carbonization. This is mostly common for flat two-dimensional things, leaves, graptolites, feathers, stuff like that. So you're looking at a picture of a fossil leaf and what happens is it gets pressed in the sediment, everything dissolves away but a ghostly film 
of the carbon or sometimes phosphate that still lets you see what the organism was, its basic morphology, but virtually everything is gone. And then we have this type of preservation here. It's very common for two types of fossils that we'll touch on in this class, but not in a big way. Uh, vertebrates, bones, uh, and then woods, so from plants. And here, both of those things, bones and wood, have lots of hollow tubes, holes, voids, spaces, vugs, whatever you want to call them. And in that case, the mineralized waters leach into those holes, they harden up, and then it preserves it as sort of this um, three-dimensional image of the holiness that's within the, um, the original organism. And then finally we get to the most common types of fossils, the fossils that most of you, if you ever are going to find fossils, will find things like these, casts and molds. So the skeleton is pressed into the sediment and that leaves an external mold of its surface. And then the cast is what gets pulled out. And so if you think about it, look at this picture right here. There's a dime for scale. Here's a little trilobite. They've sort of hit this rock and split it open, and you see this positive fossil here that made this impression here. And so this is the cast, which is like the cake that came out of the mold. And so this is a mold of the external view of this thing. So this is the outside of the skeleton, and you can have a cast and a mold. We also have a whole bunch of things that are internal molds. So a lot of organisms, they have an internal part of their body, and if that gets filled with sediment, and then that gets preserved, that's an internal mold. So what you're looking at here is a photograph of a snail. Uh, it was a snail. The little sort of the black area is a holy part. It was the shell. The shell has dissolved, but after this thing died and decayed, sediment filled up the entire void, and that gets preserved, this internal mold. Uh, it's not always just things like snail shells and clams and things like that. A lot of times when you we talk about, say, the brain case, brain case of dinosaurs, of ancient humans, that kind of thing, uh, those are internal molds as well. And so then this chart is just another image uh, showing essentially the same thing, all the different potential pathways that uh, a fossil can be made here, though it starts in the lower left and the um, soft material is already gone. You've just got the shell and then you can follow the arrows and again, you can make a fossil any one of these myriad of ways to um, have some preservation of the record of life in that area. And then another group of fossils that we'll see are trace fossils. So this is a whole separate science. It's called ichnology. And these things are also very common. Anytime an organism moves on uh, the sediment or through it, it leaves a track, a trail, whatever. Think about you. If you go walk on the beach, you leave a set of footprints behind that says that an organism, Homo sapiens, walked in this area. And all these pictures you're looking at are different creatures, different arthropods and worms and shrimps and things. And they, they leave the marks of where they lived, how they moved, how they ate, all these kind of things. They're very good for telling environmental um, history of a particular rock unit. But notice there is no hard part there. So trace fossils, these are also very common. Before I move on to the last little bit for this slide here, I want to say that we're going to see examples of most of these types of fossils in the lab, just so you can get familiar with the different types of fossils and fossil preservation that, that can exist. And then finally, after all of that, you know, the whole notion of pathways to preservation, you can ask the question, well, how good is the fossil record then? And Darwin is one of the first to actually make a statement about this. 
And look what he says. I mean, the first word that jumps out to me is imperfect. The history is preserved as only a few words, a few lines out of many, many thousands of pages of chapters of the book of earth history there. It's just not there. I've had other people say that the fossil record is poor yet deserving. We can still do very, very much with the fossil record, but this little introduction was designed for you to see that everything doesn't have a fossil record. And most things don't even have a good fossil record. Most things don't even have a fair or a poor fossil record. The whole point here, though, is that we use the fossils we do have and don't cry over and worry about the fossils that we do not. That's negative data. That's the absence of data, and we can't worry about it. We worry about the fossils that we have. Now, next time, we're going to talk about the whole science of taphonomy, which is a way of studying how we get to those preserved fossils.